Hearing the names of those for whom we are still grieving is always an emotionally powerful and deeply spiritual experience. And All Saints Day also brings to mind other family members and friends that we have lost through the years. And we can't sidestep the reality that All Saints Sunday uh, is for many people a difficult day. It's more difficult for some than for others. Grief is not the same for any two people. All Saints Sunday has a way of bringing to the surface emotions that we would rather not experience. In his very fine book, Love and Death, Forrest Church points out that when we truly love another person, we're choosing to open ourselves to pain. Dare to love another person, he says, and we immediately become susceptible to being wounded. And it's true. When we love deeply, when we truly care for another human being, when we give our heart to another person, he says, we risk having our heart broken. But Forrest Church also says this, and this is one of my very favorite lines from him. He says, we pay for love with pain, but love is worth the cost. Yes, it is. Grief is difficult. Grief takes time. There is no timetable to grief. You have heard me say this before. Grief is like a river. It flows at its own pace, and you can't push the river. Sometimes we give people, this is most unfortunate, sometimes we give people the impression that within a fairly short period of time after the death of someone they loved, that they should be able to move on through the various stages of grief and arrive at a final stage of grief we call closure. But the more we learn about grief, the more you folks teach me about grief, I'm pretty sure that the words closure and grief really never go together. We can move on with life. We can move in and through our grief, but do we ever really close the book on our grief? This morning, if you're still concerned because you are still grieving the loss of someone that you love, someone that died some time ago, give yourself a break. Grief has no timetable. All Saints Sunday is an occasion to acknowledge our shared grief. It's also an occasion for expressions of appreciation and gratitude. Think of All Saints Day as a time of footnoting, if you will. You remember doing that when you were in school, being aggravated by the precise form you had to, to follow in giving footnotes. But it's a matter of giving credit where credit is due. We do that on All Saints Sunday. We remember and give thanks for those who have influenced us along the way, for those who have touched us and taught us, nurtured and blessed us. Someone has said humility is a matter of being aware of our indebtedness to others. Those whose names we have called today and others that we have lost through the years, they live on in the lives of family members and friends. They live on in the life of this community of faith. They touched us. They made a difference to us when they were physically present with us, and they continue to matter to us and continue to inf influence us as we journey through life. And so thanks be to God for all those we have loved and lost, those to whom we are indebted. All Saints Day is not just about grief, and it's not just about gratitude for those we have loved and lost, as important as those two things are. All Saints Sunday is also about hope. 
The verses Frank read this morning, and by the way, who knows what God's voice is like, but when I hear Frank Smith read the Scripture, I'm, I'm thinking, that may be it. I don't Or I don't know, it could, it could be a female voice, I'm not sure. But, but Frank, that's wonderful. The verses Frank read this morning from the book of Revelation, are, those verses are pretty familiar to us, but in truth we do not often refer to or preach from the book of Revelation. And if Revelation is not your absolute favorite book of the Bible, and I suspect it is not, you are in very good company. Martin Luther called Revelation the theologically inadequate. And John Calvin wrote a commentary on every book of the New Testament, all 26 books. That's a test. <laughs> How many books are there in the New Testament? You can speak. There are 27. John Calvin conveniently left out the book of Revelation, and if I were writing a commentary on the New Testament, I would probably try to leave Revelation out too. Much of the language in Revelation is strange to us. It seems bizarre, even grotesque in many instances. Here it is. The book of Revelation includes thousands of angels, demons, dragons, seven-headed beasts, trumpets blow signaling the onset of various horrific catastrophes, Stars fall from the sky, the sun darkens, mountains explode, double-horned beasts appear. At the sound of the sixth trumpet, 200 million horsemen wipe out a third of humankind. And this all leads to a, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, which in turn finally leads to Satan being thrown in the lake of fire. Now what about that did you not understand? It's helpful to remember that Revelation was not written as a book, of course. It was written as a pastoral letter, written to churches established by the Apostle Paul and his co-workers. These churches were located on the western coast of what is now Turkey. And the letter was written toward the end of the first century. It was, as you know, written from the island of Patmos just off the coast of modern Turkey. We know the author's name was John, not John the disciple of Jesus, not the author of the gospel that bears that name, John. But John's letter was written to churches in crisis. John's letter was written to churches going through a difficult transition period, a period of transition. Now, where have I heard that? We have a transition committee here at our church, for those of you who are visitors today. We are all about transition these days. It was a tumultuous and uncertain time for the early church. Relations between Christians and Jews were very uncertain. Relations between Christians and the Roman government were, as usual, full of tension. Paraphrasing Eugene Boring, the author of the interpretation commentary on Revelation. He says, John's symbolic language is strange and unfamiliar to our ears, but the men and women of the churches in Asia to whom he was writing would have had no trouble understanding the meaning of his letter. Now think of that. All the commentators basically agree with that. Those who first heard this pastoral letter would not have had any trouble understanding the meaning. Those first century Christians would have understood that the point of John's letter was keep the faith. In the face of threats, in the face of persecution, when times are difficult and uncertain, when you're in a time of transi transition, remain steadfast in your faith and place your hope in God. That was the point. The prominent Episcopal preacher 
and teacher Fleming Rutledge says that Revelation has taken a bad rap through the years. She writes, Revelation should not be left to religious quacks who think of it as some sort of code to predict precise details of the end of the world. Revelation is not a Google map of heaven, and it's not a timetable for the end of the world. Revelation is not as weird as we have been led to believe, she says. It's not a hidden code. It's poetry. It's a picture. It's a vision of hope. It's first century faith language, not images or words that we would have chosen, that we would choose today, but words that John chose and images that were very appropriate to his day, all designed to strengthen faith, to encourage, inspire, and instill hope. We shall hunger no more, thirst no more, no crying, no pain. God will be with us. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. These are not words to be deciphered. These are not images to be decoded. This is the language of faith. And these words are meant to inspire us and to stir our hearts like a majestic sunrise or a musical masterpiece. Think of it. Think of our Bible, Genesis and Revelation. Our scriptures begin and conclude not with literal accounts of past and future events, but with these dramatic and powerful expressions of faith. In the beginning, God. And in the end, God. These are not scientific explanations. These are proclamations of faith. And that's where they are so powerful to us. We pick up Revelation and start reading. We go, oh, what in the world does this mean? We need to be inspired by this. It was written to people who were worshiping. It was read as a letter as they gathered in homes to worship. And it was meant to inspire them. John wrote his letter to churches in crisis, to churches in transition, and his underlying message was, lift up your hearts, praise and worship God in hope, faith, and trust that in the end all of us will be held by a love that will not let us go. I'm going to ask you to please turn to the first verse in the 21st chapter of Revelation. I know most of you bring a Bible with you, but if you did not, there's a pew, uh, a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. It's on page 1007. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. I'm trying to help you here. <laughs> Revelation 21, the first verse. Let's read it together. Sorry, choir. Need Bibles over there. <laughs> Reading it together. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Did you catch that line? Did you catch that line? I've read this passage numerous times, usually at funerals. I've never noticed, never paid attention to that line before. And again, I'm indebted to the commentary on Revelation by Eugene Boring. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. Now that in and of itself is fascinating imagery. But what do you make of this line? And the sea was no more. Where was John when he wrote his letter? Of course, he was on an island. He was on an island, separated from friends, separated from the members of these churches. These were people he knew and loved. For him, in that moment, the sea 
represented separation from those he loved and from those he longed to be with. But in the end, he says, there will be no more sea. What a magnificent image this is. When it's all about God, there will be no more sea, no more separation, no more alienation, no obstacles to being together in community, all God's children. When it's all about God, there will be no more distrust, no more fear of each other, no more prejudice or discrimination. In the beloved community, there will be no barriers, no walls, and that great vast sea which keeps us separated from each other as human beings will be no more. What a powerful, beautiful image this is. And it's more than just an image. It is God's call to God's people today. It's more than just a dream for some time down the road in the sweet by and by. This is God's call for us today. This is our purpose. This is the reason for our existence as a church. To work for the day when there is no more sea, no more alienation, no more separation. This is what we are called to do now. This is who we are called to be right now. This is God's way here and now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we pray. Oh God, we pray for family members and friends of those whose names we have read this morning, for them and for all who are grieving. May they experience and gather strength from the love and prayers that are radiating to you from this congregation. And Lord, grant us strength for today and hope for tomorrow as we seek to be the people that you are calling us to be. In Christ's name, amen.